Test, testing, sound, check. Test, 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 test. Sound check, one, two, three. Sound check, one, two.
Okay. All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'd like to warmly welcome you to St. Christopher's Parish this afternoon. Uh, I hope you had a, a, a good Sunday so far, a good day. Yeah, so this afternoon basically is the uh, last talk in the series on discipleship. The title of the series is Authentic Discipleship. Authentic Discipleship. And the reason why we put this together is because uh, Joe, Glenn and myself have felt in our hearts that well, our churches need encouragement in the area of discipleship, in pursuing the calling that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. Just want to remind you of the previous talks in terms of the title. So talk number one was entitled Discipleship According to Jesus, where we looked at particularly Luke chapter 16, I think it was, where Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, let them deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow me. So that was the focus for that talk, and it was, it was very confronting, but nevertheless, that's what it is. You know, being a disciple of Jesus Christ means that you deny yourself and you follow him uh, daily. You take up your cross and follow him. So that was the first talk. Talk number two was delivered by Glenn at Nativity, and it focused on the interface between discipleship and the heart. Glenn particularly focused on our loves. What are the things that we love? And the point that he was trying to convey was, God should be our preeminent love. Did you aim into that? God should be our foremost love. And that is where idolatry comes in, when something takes the place of God in our lives. Thankfully, there is the concept of repentance. We, we get guilty, we become guilty of idolatry from time to time. But thanks be to God that he forgives us of our sins if we repent. Amen? So that was the second talk. Talk number three was delivered by Margaret Conway last Sunday. You did a good job. There was a good turnout to your talk. It was great because Bishop Richard Elna was here. He was the MC. So Margaret spoke on uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and costly discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer really, or is, remains to be uh, a pivotal figure in the whole concept of costly discipleship. I was telling some people last Sunday that doctoral theses are being written on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, not just about his life, his upbringing, but also in terms of his theology, because his writings uh, are quite groundbreaking in this area of costly discipleship. So that's, that's interesting, so that was good. And for today, we've got Joe, our Dean. So Joe, it's good to have you. He's going to talk on that topic there that you see on the screen, discipleship and donuts. And the good news is this. I know that we're going to be enjoying Joe's talk, but at the end of the talk, at the end of the discussion, we all head into the, the hall for afternoon tea. And I was told that there are donuts. Yeah, that we can all enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, can I just say something before I hand over to Joe? We all, I, I guess those of us who knew that Reuben, Joe's second son, was going to have surgery, I think we all prayed, right? We prayed for the safety, for the success of the surgery. The good news is, as you probably already heard, the surgery was successful. The surgeons were very pleased with the outcome. So thanks be to God for that. And uh, how is Reuben? Is he, is he uh, sleeping all right? Is there a lot of pain? Is he suffering? Not too much. He, he's still uh, so just over two weeks now. And um, so it was a full spinal surgery. Um, but they didn't have to reconstruct his rib cage as was potentially going to have to happen. Um, they found that his spine was quite flexible. And so or his whole bone structure really, so as they straightened him out, uh, it worked really well, which uh, meant that they didn't need to do as much as what was potentially going to be needed. Um, but he's doing really well, recovery went well, and he's just dealing with the pain that's going to be there for 
a period of time as his body recovers. Um, and then he just needs to learn, I guess, how to move again in certain things. Um, you know, with rods in his back, he, he can't yeah. bend over like we're used to doing. Um, so he's just going to have to relearn how he does a few things. You know, even the simple things like brushing his teeth. Um, you know, he just can't bend over the sink quite the same as what he used to and things like that. So, but he is doing remarkably well. Starting to get a little bit grumpy, I think. <laughs> just, 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 it's just carrying on, you know. Yeah. Another day of pain. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for updating us. Ruben will continue to be in our prayers. Mm. And you and Appreciate it. How are you and your wife? You're coping all right. We're coping. You're coping all right. Yeah, no, it's going well. Going well. <laughs> Let's pray. Uh, we'll pray for today's talk. We will also pray for uh, Ruben's full recovery. Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us in this place. We thank you for your grace uh, demonstrated for us in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, Lord, for the successful surgery of Reuben. Uh, and we thank you for the way you're sustaining the Keeley family through this uh, difficult uh, time. This is also an opportunity for them to experience your grace your special grace. We do pray that you would uh, work in a special way in their faith, uh, in their hearts and in their lives, so that this difficult period in their lives would draw them to you. We thank you for all the provisions uh, uh, that you have, uh, you have given for them, for the whole family, uh, including the financial provisions that have come from different sources, including mm -hmm from different church families uh, across the diocese. We thank you for the unity that we've, we've seen uh, by way of the support that, mm -hmm. that has come in for the, the Keeley family. Father, we look to you for full healing for Reuben. We pray that by your grace and mercy and power, he would recover, the wounds would heal up and that he would get used to the major changes in his life, especially in the area now of um, his movements. He cannot now move in the same way as before. So enable him to get used to these changes. And we pray that he, by your spirit, would understand why this is happening. Uh, just minister to his young spirit, mm. to his young faith in you. Enable him, Lord, to persevere under trial and bless him abundantly and bless the Keeley abundantly. And we pray for the talk today. We pray blessing on Joe. Give him energy, wisdom, and a free, that sense of freedom to deliver uh, what he has prepared to share it with us. Bless our time together. I pray that we will all benefit from it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Dale. Appreciate it. So as you've already heard, we do have donuts on the menu. You've just got to sit there and wait patiently in the meantime. So as we um, started thinking about this series, we started thinking, you know, discipleship is such a huge topic. There's so much we can say and explore around discipleship. Um, you know, and, and so really there was a question, what are we going to cover as a group? And you know, it was great having the, the talk about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You can't really talk about discipleship without going to Dietrich. Um, <coughs> and there was some other stuff as well. And I, was, I sort of left there at the end, I, I picked up the last of the series. And I was like, what am I going to do this on? And I've been stewing for a few weeks, just wondering what, what, what. And this idea of Discipleship and donuts came to mind. That sounds good. Let's go with that. So I put that forward as the title of the talk. I was then left with working out what that was going to be about. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see where we go. Well, two weeks ago, um, just over two weeks ago, we were sitting in Wellington and we had found or should I say Susan, my wife, found very quickly a nice little cafe where she could get a good coffee each morning and uh, 
And, and, and that was, you know, kept her happy. As long as she's got a coffee, she was happy. And so one morning I went and picked it up for her, and there sitting on the counter was this bread basket full of donuts. They get these donuts specially made, and they turn up on a Thursday and Friday in this cafe. And these donuts, they were big. Uh, they were big. And, and they weren't just a bit of icing with some sprinkles on top. These were gourmet donuts. It's things like popcorn on top and walnuts and, and um, caramel this and that and fruit covering it and all sorts of, you know, they looked good. And I was like, I cannot, I cannot come in and not get one of these. So then the decision was, which one? <laughs> and so, I went for the biggest. <laughs> they had all these great round donuts, but they also had these apple donuts. I think they might have been Danish or something like that. And they, they weren't the typical round donut that we think of. It was more just a, a dumples mixture. And, and this donut was so big, that she couldn't get it into the paper bag. <laughs> so then she had to go back and find another one that was going to fit in the paper bag a bit easier. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I, I don't think so. I, I, the ones we get today, I'm sure, are going to be extremely scrumptious. Just going to be different. It's one of the things about donuts. There's so many varieties. So here I had this one big donut, and I was just cutting it up and having a bit then and a bit later, and it took me all day to get through it. It was quite good. But back to the discipleship. Back to the discipleship. Well, unfortunately, I haven't actually managed to capture or catch previous two talks, and I'm not sure what's been covered and what hasn't. And I've been thinking, you know, how, how, how do I approach this? And I thought today this discipleship on donuts could be me just coming in, knowing that the, the main thing has already been said. The donut has been, you know, set there. And I'm just going to come along and put the nice icing on top and sprinkle a few bits. So, so today is just a little bit of a, a little bit of this and a little bit of that uh, to throw into our conversation on discipleship. Now, the simple dis um, definition of discipleship, I just want to start with and put up there, is one from Rick Warren. Well, that's a good start. Oh. Okay. What's going on here, Dale? Yeah, oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. A simple definition of discipleship from Pastor Rick Warren, who I'm sure most of us have heard of. A disciple is one who thinks, feels, and acts like Jesus Christ. It is being conformed to the image of Christ that's God's number one purpose in our lives, to make us like Jesus. And I'm sure over the last few weeks we've explored a few different definitions of discipleship. They come with different words, but essentially they're all the same idea. Us becoming like Christ. And I know for myself, there's a long way to go before I'm going to resemble Christ. And I understand that Glenn spoke a couple of weeks ago about the heart of discipleship that, and how true discipleship should take hold of our hearts with a deep desire to become like Jesus Christ. Does it? Are our hearts really filled with desire to be transformed and changed and moulded and to give up on some of the things that we know are a little bit wrong but we just don't want to give up on? And there's quite a confrontation as we start to look at discipleship because we do actually have to seek becoming more like Jesus Christ and becoming less sinful in nature as we are. And that can be a little bit uncomfortable. And I think one of the issues that we find 
as we start talking about discipleship, is that as we come to recognise that actually there's a bit of work involved and there's going to be a bit of sacrifice involved and a bit of change is going to be required, that, well, maybe I'll just make this easy on myself and, and, and I'll do a little bit of discipleship. And I think the church has done this for a while now. And it's left us in a place where I don't think our church is full of good disciples. Last year, our Bishop Steve spoke a message to our diocese and said that there was a hole in the bucket. And he was referring to a number of issues that are facing the church, including a number that exist, I believe, because of our failure in discipleship. And I would go so far as to say that there is a hole in the donut. No matter how much we dress it up, no matter how good and tasty we make it look, there's still a hole in it. Now I must say that 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 apple donut that I had didn't have a hole in it and it was good. <laughs> but generally when we get a donut, there's a hole in it. And I think our discipleship, when we talk about it within a church context, often has this gaping big hole in the middle. That actually we don't do it well. And we're afraid to admit it. And I think discipleship is one of the greatest challenges facing our current church. Back when I was a young person, in my teenage years, wandering around Blenheim and just lurking in dark corners, well, no, I probably didn't really, but... In our youth group, we came across this song. It was, it was all over the radio at the time, and everyone was playing it. It was, it was from a band called DC Talk. And, and um, you know, there's songs like Jesus Freak and others. But on the CD, there was, there was this interlude between a couple of songs. And it had one of the um, musicians or someone reading out a quote. And the quote said this, The single greatest cause of atheism in our world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the, den- out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. And I don't think that's changed. You know, this was 20, 30 years ago that this was being said, and I don't think it was a a new quote at that time. And I'm sure we can look back decades, decades, even hundreds of years, and see a church that has done that, that has proclaimed one thing and acted in a completely different way. And so it's, it's no wonder that we're now faced with a culture around us and a whole lot of people looking at the church saying, why should we listen to you? What have you really got to say? Because we've been saying some important stuff and proclaiming some strong beliefs, but too often we've failed to live it out in the reality and the, the day to day life. It's not so much a theological question that we're struggling with, it's a discipleship question. We proclaim to be disciples. Yet I don't think we really want to face the cost of discipleship. There's a hole in the donut. Christian discipleship is the ongoing transformation of an individual becoming like Jesus in character and purpose as he or she grows in that relational intimacy with him. But for a church of over 2,000 years of experience and wisdom and seeking to do discipleship, I think there's a big question mark there. Why has it been so bad? And so I'm going to offer a few thoughts and scatter some toppings and flavours as we continue to explore discipleship. First point. Do discipleship together. 
Let me read from uh, Paul, who wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until all until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here or there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. There's a lot in that. But this passage, I, I believe, gives us both an image of the discipleship process and a sound reason of why it's so important. The image is of the body being equipped for service so that the whole body may be built up together, striving for unity in the faith, and deeper knowledge in Christ, and to become mature, reaching the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. It speaks of a process that aims for the fullness in Christ, not just a little bit here or a little bit of there, but to see full maturity. Importantly, we see that this process takes place and builds up the whole body of Christ. So while we often speak of an individual process, we cannot compartmentalize or isolate our discipleship as an individual process. We can't take part of the body and pull it off and say, grow. No matter how much we want it to grow, it's just not going to grow if it's being disconnected from the body. And it's the same with discipleship. We need to be connected and part of the body and to do discipleship as a body. Christian maturity is found in unity. Listen to Paul's words again and recognize that he's speaking to a church, not a person. So he says to the Ephesian church, Christ gave to equip his people. It's plural, it's inclusive, so that the body may be built up. And then he goes on to say, we will grow, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body. Paul's vision of the mature body is through the combined giftedness and unity of us all growing up together in Christ, taking that journey together, not leaving someone behind, not allowing someone to go off and try and do it by themselves. It's only together. And there tends to be this idea among Christians that discipleship is a personal journey. And so we, we start speaking of discipleship and we, we say to each other, well, how's your discipleship journey going? What are you be doing to be a disciple? And the expectation is that they somehow, in their private life, at home, behind closed doors, are somehow doing something right that is growing them up and maturing them to be like Christ. And yes, some good stuff might be happening. But it cannot happen without others being on that journey together. It was never intended to be done by itself. And to try and do so will severely limit your growth towards attaining maturity in Christ, as well as robbing the wider body of your gifts and of you being part of the journey of the wider body. Now I'm not saying that your journey in discipleship is fully public but it should at least be shared. Talking with one another, what did Christ teach me today? What did I read in scripture and how did he reveal something? 
Because while you were re reading something in Romans, I might have been reading something in Luke. And both might have spoken to us in different ways. And over a quick conversation, suddenly instead of just one revelation from my own personal Bible study, well, I can share in your revelation too of what God has spoken to you about. And, and we share through life's experiences together. Walk closely with a group, a group of others who will help you and guide you and pick you up when you stumble or fall, who will laugh with you and cry with you, who you can learn from, and who you can encourage each other together. Jesus' gathering of the twelve disciples is a perfect picture of disciples being discipled together, seeking to follow Christ together, but learning and supporting each other on that journey. Peter was the one who answered Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? But all the disciples learnt in that moment. Thomas was the one who voiced his doubt, but he wasn't the only one who was doubting. And they all learnt together in that process. Judas betrayed. And yet they all let Jesus down. We learn together through our failures and our triumphs. When Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he was speaking at a time when the church was just starting out and expanding throughout that, that known world. And it was at a time when the leaders of the church hadn't been to theological college. Some of them hadn't even been brought up in the faith. There were no articles of faith or theological textbooks. And Paul highlights that in amongst all the good that was happening, there was an abundance of deceitful and wayward teaching that was buffeting the young church. And that's quite understandable. There was no full unity in how Christ was being taught. And there was a whole lot of people that were teaching about Christ who had never known Christ. And it was all just a mix. And Paul saying, we need to push into Jesus Christ to know who he is, that we can grow in maturity so that then we can see what is right and what is wrong. Unfortunately, the modern church is still buffeted by wayward and erroneous teaching. And I think, particularly in our current climate, where, where we can technically propose any theology we would like as being true, regardless of historical or biblical integrity, just because we believe it to be true, and no one has a right to say otherwise. So let's do it together. Let's keep each other accountable. That was that quote from Ephesians I read out. <laughs> Number two, Christian discipleship needs to address every dimension in our life. Now many, many years ago, you know, I've got a couple of greys here, I was running the youth ministry at Nativity. And one week I used for an activity for the young people to explore Jesus and to explore how Jesus was present in different parts of their life. And, and we used the image of a house having different rooms. And each room being a different part of life. Like the lounge was a place where we could meet with Jesus and fellowship with him. And the kitchen was where we could have a, a good meal with him and sit down and be fed by, by the word of God. And, and the different rooms were, were different things. But as part of working through this, there was a recognition that there was a hallway cupboard. And in the hallway cupboard was all the stuff that we didn't want anybody else to see when they came through the front door. And we'll just shove it in. Keep it hidden. 
And no matter how clean the rest of the house looks, lurking in the hallway cupboard, was all that stuff we wanted to keep quiet about. And it's the same within our lives. There are parts of us that we can be quite happy to let Jesus in. And you can have a good look around and we've got no problems at all. But sometimes, I think pretty much most of the time, there are places that we just don't want him to venture in at all. And so when it comes to discipleship, we're quite ready and and, and happy for him to have a certain say in certain parts of our life. But not other parts. Because this is my part. I just want to keep this to myself. This is something I enjoy, even if it's not that good for us. This is something for me. Jesus, you can, you can have that stuff over there, but leave this for me. And there's this failure to allow Jesus to be Lord of our lives. We've let him have, have, have a little bit. But is that really lordship? When we fail to surrender ourselves completely before him. The gospel message is that every part of our lives can be transformed by the power of Christ. And discipleship is working towards and allowing every part of our lives to be transformed. But if we're hiding parts of our lives away from the presence of Jesus Christ, then it cannot be transformed. And by doing this, we negate or turn from the fullness of the gospel that is offered to us. Sometimes the places in life that are the most wounded or most in need of Christ are those parts where we seek to hide. And we hide those parts from everybody, including Jesus. Even though he knows they are there, we still like to pretend he doesn't. These are the places that the gospel has the most power to transform us. And in this transformation, we find a powerful testimony. Perhaps our churches would be more full and more alive and having greater impact if we opened up our lives to more of the gospel reality and let Jesus into those hidden places. We all will have a hallway cupboard or a place where we like to hide stuff from Jesus. Some it might be bigger than a hallway cupboard. It might be a whole rumpus room. And for others, it might be the whole house. And you've got a caravan parked outside and you're quite happy for Jesus to come visit on the holidays and have a little bit of time together in the camper van, providing he doesn't come into the house. Discipleship is meant for every part of our lives. I've got a video, just a short one. Jesus, I have decided to give you this. Really? Yeah. You know whoever sits here makes all the decisions, right? I know, and I'm always making decisions, but you make the perfect decisions, so you just sit right down and start making them. Wow, I'm honored. I mean, this feels great. Kathleen, guess what? I just got my new credit card. It's time to go shopping. Oh, really? I thought your husband and you were going to pay off debt. Oh, yeah. I mean, money's kind of tight, but I figured he doesn't have to know about it. So do you want to go with me? No. (laughs) No? Why? Uh, What I mean is, um, I don't know. Um, So let me check my schedule, and then I'll get back to you. Okay, yeah, give me a call. Okay. (laughs) Kat, what's going on? What do you mean? Well, I'm kind of one cheek in here. (laughs) Look, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. You wanted me to sit here, right? Well, of course. And whoever sits here makes all the decisions? Right. So what's the problem? Oh, there's not a problem. I just, I don't know what I was thinking. Really, please, here, sit down. As long as you're sure. I'm sure. Okay, so <laughs> let's start over. Okay. All right. Kat, I noticed that you've been losing your temper a lot lately. 
Right. So, okay, Jesus, you know what? I know what you're going to say, but um, you, do? you don't know the whole situation, you know? Oh. I, well, all I'm saying is that your attitude is a decision. Yes, of course, but I have a lot going on right now. Well, I know you're under a lot of pressure. Pressure? Jesus, you don't understand pressure, okay? This isn't working, Kat. What? We can't both sit on the seat. It's either me or it's you. Okay, I know. You know, I, I didn't think it was going to be this hard, but here, just take it. No, I'm not going to take it. You have to give it to me. Okay, here. Kathleen, make a choice. I can't. You just did. No one has ever said that true discipleship will be easy. It involves allowing Jesus into places where we would rather he did not venture. It means being vulnerable and giving up things in our lives that, that are not reflective of Jesus. But it's only in complete surrender that true freedom can be found. Number three, Christian discipleship is progressive in nature. I believe there's a basic principle in discipleship, and I'm sure we'll all recognise this, that discipleship is a lifelong process. It doesn't just happen. It's not something that just goes click when we're saved, and suddenly everything's great and perfect in our lives. It's not a time of training in which we graduate and say, well, now I'm a qualified disciple. It's more about a way of living continually that seeks to always put Jesus Christ first and foremost at the forefront of our decisions and helping us with the opportunities that are before us. And we seek to do this faithfully moment by moment. And it takes us each day, each day where we're at, and it seeks each day to step us a little bit closer to Jesus. It's a process, though not one that we will complete this side of eternity. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus and his disciples are traveling through Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks his disciples as they're traveling, who do you say that I am? I believe this is one of the most confronting questions that we could possibly contemplate. <coughs> its answer has immediate and eternal consequences. It invites us to delve the depths of theology and Christology and even anthropology, looking at our understanding of who Jesus Christ is as well as our place as humans. And yet it's not a question that goes away once we've answered it once. Once we have encountered this question in the very presence of Christ, it will never stop echoing in our hearts, seeking to be answered again and again and again. At each turn in life, each decision, each celebration, each heartache, this question lingers on the edges of our conscience. Who do you say that I am? Jesus is the one who makes himself known. He was the one who stepped into creation, becoming incarnate. He test and is testified to by the Spirit of God. He is the one who reveals himself to us. We have not discovered Jesus. He has made himself visible and present. He has stepped towards us. And as we encounter him in this revelation, we must answer. We cannot do anything but answer the question of, who do you say that I am? Who is this person who we have encountered, who has made himself known? And so it is that each time we see something new 
of this person and gather a new revelation of who he is, we encounter that question again. And we, asked, we are asked, who do you say that I am? Like Peter, we can answer, you are the Christ. You are the Lord. You are Messiah. God of all, Master of all I am, King of kings. You are healer, comforter, sustainer. You're my hope, my guide, my saviour, my defender, light of the world, the cornerstone. Those are all words that we can use to describe Jesus. But not one of us would have understood all of those and all the others in a single moment. As we progress through our discipleship and, and come closer to Christ in intimacy and get to know him more and more of him is revealed to us, we start to understand what some of these words truly mean. And those words can confront us. What does it mean that Christ is our hope when we've just been diagnosed with a terminal illness? What does it mean when Christ is healer when your son's having spinal surgery? What does it really mean when we proclaim and sing in our worship songs that Jesus is Lord? And so that question echoes time and time again. Who do you say that I am? Discipleship could be said to be all about asking this question daily. Responding as is appropriate. And so let each day, let each moment with Christ bring new revelation. And as we grow and as we help each other find new revelation in who this Christ is, let us respond in an appropriate way. He is yesterday and today and forever, never changing, but always more than we already know. So keep seeking. Last one. Discipleship is intended to be reproductive. And I don't think any of us would dispute that part of our Christian calling is to go and make disciples or followers of Jesus. Jesus himself commands us to go and make disciples of all nations. And for millennia, the church has sought to go and make disciples throughout the world. Admittedly, we have not always done this well. And sometimes we have created some rather big problems in doing so. One of the problems we often find in our churches is that too many of our people believe that they are incapable of discipling another person. There is a belief, a false belief, that only trained theologians or someone who is ordained could possibly have the spiritual wisdom to disciple another person. It's a load of rubbish. That's a new theological statement. It's a load of rubbish. The people around us who need discipling can always learn from those who are a step ahead. For those who have gone before. For some, some will always be well ahead on that journey. Some will be beside us. Some will be behind us. But even those well in front may still be able to learn something from us who are following. We may have something to give those who are beside us. And we definitely have something we can give to those who are behind, who may have just started out their journey. There are opportunities to help others grow closer to Christ to encourage them, to help them understand scripture. For you to share some of those 
revelations of who Jesus Christ is and how you have answered that question of who do you say I am? This is discipleship. Helping others to take a step forward. And there's something in the nature of discipleship that allows all disciples to be able to disciple others. Some will naturally be more gifted. However, each of us can walk alongside others. And here's the real challenge. I'd like to suggest that you would struggle to be a mature disciple if you have not discipled others. Because in that process of discipling, we ourselves grow so much. We're challenged. We step outside that, that it's all about me place. And it starts to become about the other. And I think that's when we start to find maturity. To disciple others is ultimately about pouring our lives into another person so that they also will learn to ask that question, who do you say that I am? And this doesn't need to be done alone. We don't need to disciple another person alone. It's together, remember? And so we can disciple another person together. Maybe as a small group, invite someone in who needs to grow. Maybe as a coffee group, invite someone to come along who needs to grow and, and be around some Christians who have been there for a bit longer. There are different ways of doing it. And it doesn't require a PhD. I don't think many of us have that. Many PhDs in the room? Well, there we go. <laughs> Jesus said, go and make disciples. And I think we've, we've failed at this at times in the church. We've failed to do it well, for sure. And it's perhaps the reason that the church has lost much of its credibility. And maybe it's why we've actually spent the last four Sundays having to talk about discipleship, rather than celebrating what we're already doing. Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. We know the verse so well. It drives so much of what we do in the church. I'd like to end with a final quote. This is from a guy I haven't heard of before, Phil Meadows. He is a professor of disciple making and missional ecclesiology. And so therefore, it must be good. <laughs> if, we may, if we seek to make disciples, we will become vital congregations, have authentic worship, experience real fellowship, and develop effective mission. It's a good statement, isn't it? If we seek to make disciples, we will become vital congregations, have authentic worship, experience real fellowship, and develop effective mission. But if we start with a strategy instead, we usually end up running programs rather than sharing our faith. If we start with community, we may end up with social circles rather than spiritual communities. And if we start with a church service, we're likely to end up as consumers rather than disciples. What does it mean to reprioritize discipleship? And that's it for me. Um, I guess it's an opportunity to ask some questions. 
both um, maybe about what we've talked about today, but maybe there's been some other questions stewing from over the last few weeks that you'd like to ask. I'm not going to guarantee I have an answer. Dayo will though. <laughs> we'll see how we go. Any questions? Or comments? Anything you'd like to add? How many donuts does it take to make a good disciple? That comes down to how good the donut itself is. If it's a good donut, it may only be one. If it's a bad donut, it may take several. How's that sound? Why is it so difficult for us to speak to each other about our faith? Yes. And are you, when you say each other, are you talking about within the church or um, outside? In, in our own congregations, but also outside, and I'm speaking mm. for myself. Yeah, yes. for sure, yeah. Let me start with um, a bit of a tangent. Yesterday I had a funeral of Robin Young. Many of you will know Robin. He's been part of our parish for decades been our treasurer, been on our um, vestry. Many of you would have seen him at different combined events for many, many years. Sadly, we said farewell. It always amazes me at funerals how much you learn about somebody as you start hearing the stories from other people. I think sometimes we're afraid to share our own story. And sometimes we might actually need to hear the story from others. And it takes openness, it takes a culture where, where people are safe. And I don't know if church is always that safe place. We've experienced ourselves at times that we've been hurt by the church, by times that we've shared something personal or, or something that's hurt us. And sometimes the the people around us haven't always reacted well. Um, or we may have seen that happen to somebody else. Uh, a couple of years ago as I was moving around the diocese, one of the sermons I was preaching was about how the church had hurt people and, and apologising for that. And, and I think the recognition that actually within the church we don't always get it right is actually part of building that culture. And until we start getting some of that right, people are going to not want to share and talk about their faith. Because talking about faith is actually quite a vulnerable thing. And sometimes I don't think we're overly certain about how good our theology is with some of our faith beliefs. And so when we start thinking about it and sharing with others, we actually make our theological beliefs vulnerable for correction. Um, for our own experiences with God where we've experienced something and, and others might go, oh, that can't have been God. Well, that was just a coincidence. And, and I think we actually need to be careful in how we respond to people's testimony and to their um, stories in life. Be more open to each other. But a whole congregation may not always be the right context for that. And, and I think that's where a small group can play a vital part in discipleship where we actually journey in life together. We actually get to know the person through the ups and the downs and the grumpiness and do the celebrations together and walk the difficult places. Then we can actually start sharing what's on our heart. Does that answer? I think so. I think it's developing a culture mm. that's, that's the key. Yeah. Culture is a big key within the church. If you haven't got a good culture in the church, uh, it's going to hinder discipleship and, and growth. Yes, I can definitely make copies available. 
somehow. Um, let me think on how the best way of doing that is. Um, how many people from St Christopher's? A few. How many from Nativity? And anywhere else? Nativity, St Christopher's, nowhere else? No? Okay. So I might just make some copies available um, of some of those quotes to both the churches. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? How have you found this series as we've spoken about discipleship? My, my turn to ask you a question. Has it been helpful? Some good questions? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you've been asking yourself some questions? Good, good. Yeah. Has it taken you in, a, in any direction of thinking that you were not expecting? It's made you think about your beliefs, yeah? Good, good. Yeah. Made me question my own integrity. Made you question your integrity? Because one of the things I like to think I put together, but, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking of what I talked about last week. Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Bonhoeffer, uh, such an amazing character. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. C can I ask, how many of you will go away from this series with at least one question that you're pondering? Yeah, good, good. Yep. And it's not necessarily a question that we've posed, but something that, that's come out and challenged you in some way. So I I'm hoping that that has been part of um, you know, why we do this, is, is to help you grow, to help us grow. You know, it's a challenge putting together something a bit different to a normal sermon. Um, but, but we enjoy it, don't we, Dale? It's good to do something different. So thank you for coming. Um, anything else you'd like to add, Dale? Yeah, thank you, Joe. I have been sensing in my spirit that perhaps because today is the last session, we would, uh, and I think you would be supportive, I think you would be supportive of this, Joe, that perhaps it would be fitting and edifying for us to uh, read a couple of pages from the prayer book. Um, just to, to end this, and could you close in prayer after this? We do this, John. Or actually, this reading that I think and I, I, I'm, I'd like us to do has the prayer in it. Um, could you please turn to page 394? 394. This is a part of a liturgy for baptism. Um, and as you're aware, uh, in every baptism ceremony, those, the candidates for baptism, we ask them to confess their faith. And I believe, as you, Joe, you highlighted it, and I, I think that's a good thought. You know, that question that Jesus posed to his apostles, who do you think that I am? And you say that discipleship entails or calls upon us to ask ourselves that question on a daily basis. So, 394, the celebration of faith. It says all standing. So would you please stand? So we will do the reading up until 395. Uh, in other words, we will close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us rejoice with those who have committed our, themselves to Christ and celebrate the faith of our baptism. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe, I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Almighty creator, creator of heaven and earth. earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And as Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Praise God. Um, yes, there is our afternoon tea. Thank you, Joe, for your talk. There's afternoon tea. We can all enjoy the donuts and the copper. Um, before we go, let's say the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.